Going once, going twice, sold. You're listening to The Property Pod, an accessible and easy way to get into or help understand the goings-on of the property market. Join Aaron, John and Pat as they discuss all things real estate, most likely get sidetracked and then try and rein it all back in as they present The Property Pod. That's right. You're listening to The Property Pod, an easy to access podcast all about the real estate market. I'm Aaron Horn. I'm here with only one member of the team today. It's a ghost town. It's a ghost town in here. There's no fur jackets. There's no goblets. There's none of the rigmarole that is Patrick Berry. Patrick has left us to our devices, Johnny Mac. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, see, I don't know if it's going to be a good or a bad thing or indifferent. Um, I know. I feel like we have to really put in our best, put our best foot forward. Yeah. I did did say to Johnny up at the um, Agent Cooper, well, with Paddy not here, it could go really well or we could just end up talking about Marvel for like 30 straight minutes. But we do, we do have a structure. We do have a structure uh, because when we're looking at, all right, what do we discuss? Because normally we'd like to have all three of us. We could revisit some of the questions that we'd been asked in the past. Yes. Max Mailbag, I thought we could call it. I like that. Yes. We we need, we need, well, we we could have like a, um, the sound of a bagpipe playing <laughs> <laughs> that would be terrible and then you'd see the old listener number just drop <laughs> even more dramatically <laughs> I hate that <laughs> music yeah. either that would get a lot of uh, readers from Scotland just feeling yeah. really patriotic <laughs> I reckon you're telling me about the Scottish Highlands <laughs> I'd love to know about property here yeah, John. yeah, yeah 100% <laughs> No, so what we did was we've gone through some of the correspondence that we have received, mm. um, and I've I've gone actually Pat would be annoyed with this. I've gone back and printed them out on paper, which is a naughty, a no no. Oh yeah, but I don't have my laptop <clears throat> with me, so I've gone old, printed them out. A few bits of correspondence here. You've got your laptop, which is good, but yeah, I thought we could go through some of the correspondence that we received from listeners, mm. and you know, answer some questions. I know one of them they even said. You guys were so close to answering the question in the episode, mm. and then you got sidetracked. Yeah. So we can either do one of two things: we can get right to that point again, and then not have the payoff for them. Yeah. Or we can actually go well, right into it. Let's just ask that one point because I think that was along the lines of: was that the first home buyer or the rent vesting um, um, component? Let me just check. All right, John, I found it here. This is the one. This is the one from Sarah. This one's from a while ago. We. Mm. Um, I think he might have emailed her back and, and gave her some correspondence, but let's just throw it at her if she's still listening and we can um, talk about it with anyone else that has a similar question. She was yeah, she was yeah. the one that – she was from Victoria or she bought in Victoria, I think. Um, yep, um, I think Sarah had um, – she'd just started a new job at the time up in the northwest coast of Tassie. I think that was around about right. And she had a lot of uh, – obviously because she was um, – she came from a family that all of them had rented. No one has, um, had – no one before. was really a homeowner. So obviously she wanted to change the fold. Yep. Um, now obviously I think that's a hard thing sometimes if you've got a family and all your immediate references aren't doing what you're doing. Which no, is yeah, hard. you're trying to break it out of the mould and say like this is what I want to do. Yeah, and exactly. It's like where do I start? Yeah. There was one thing she said in there that we nearly covered off. Yes, um, yeah, this yeah. is the bit. So yeah. what, was, what was that bit? It was... Um, um, so it was... It was here as well. Another question you actually asked in the investment episode, but got mm. sidetracked. That with. would have been with Blake. Yep. Yep. Yeah. With yeah, old Smeds. Mm. Uh, it was about whether or not whether it is worth taking up the first homeowner's offer and living in it for six months. Mm. Uh, start with I figured my savings on the fifty percent stamp duty reduction would be less than the rent I would earn in six months. Mm. But after looking at the interest rate difference between the first homeowner and investor uh, over the life of the loan, I'm now not too sure what's the better option. And then she goes on to say, you were so close to answering one of my biggest questions. <laughs> love love that you get sidetracked, though. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, I think um, my first thought on that, if we think back to what Blake was, he was more so about choosing um, – his end goal was obviously financial freedom. Yep. So purchasing those properties that are going to be paying off their own debt. And then he gets to live the lifestyle he wants by renting in um, Hobart. Yeah. Because to purchase a house in Hobart with the median being what, what he would have wanted might have been anywhere from five to six hundred grand. And that was just, set, you know, one, he couldn't afford it. And two, um, it was, it, you know, it wasn't going to be an option effectively. So there's another friend of mine, uh, Jessica Chi. She's one, a really successful agent in Glen Waverley in Victoria. Yep. I want to tell you this story because in that area, most of the residents in there aren't investors. They are moving there to purchase because it's a very, because they want the specific schools. So they're buying prestige. Yep. Um, now the average property, it, Price and that is one point two to one point five million. However, your average rental return on that is only about four hundred bucks. 
Okay. Week. So to rent in that area is incredibly cheap, but to buy is phenomenally expensive. But it's just the culture of the of the like the people that are buying. So the market will determine that kind of situation. Like here, the rent seems so high in comparison to what you can be buying for. Yep. Whereas this Glen Waverley suburb... In the complete reverse. Yeah, that's really so, interesting. So with that, with Glen Waverley, for example, that'd be purchased that as an investment property for financial return would be a stupid decision if you wanted yep. cash flow. The idea for them is that they might, um, they're buying it, in, in most instances, cash. Um, it's just a result of the cultures they're from. And with that then, you know, they're hoping for capital gains. So I tell you that story in that um, where the question comes back to, do I surrender my 50% deduction from stamp duty? You've got to play the numbers. Yep. So in many senses, the stamp duty works out to around about 3 3.5% of a purchase price. So if you've got a $300,000 sale, your stamp duty could be anywhere from eight to nine grand. I'm, obviously, you know... You're just throwing correct. magic I'm just numbers. Throwing some numbers. Yep. So what are you getting? You're four grand off. Now, like she said, is that if I purchased the investment property and forego, forego that, um, that $4,000, is that rent return is going to be gifting her um, going to actually be going to be more beneficial than is saving that $4,000. That four grand? And you can really do a quick calculation on that. And, just, and also to um, in that, all right, well, if I'm getting $300 a week times you know, 10 weeks, that's, you know, three grand or so. Yep. Um, and then multiply that over 52 weeks. And, you know, obviously you're probably going to get to see a better return than that $4,000. But again, it comes down to her lifestyle. If you're looking at working and living where your life's going to be highly mobile, you might be six months here, 12 months there. The problem is if you buy, buy property everywhere you go, you've got both a purchase with a stamp duty cost and a sell cost. So in order to be able to, you know, get out and escape. Balance the Wager. You, you just re, the reality of it is you, you're just going to be losing money over time. Yep. So if I was in her position, and that's why I've got a good disclaimer at the end of it, I'd be doing what Blake has probably done, where he has he's just planting his money in investments that are paying themselves off. Yep. Um, not too concerned about the four thousand dollars because four thousand dollars over the course of thirty years of your lifespan of that loan is pretty negligible. So it's more playing the long game than playing that short. That's right. Um, but fundamentally, she, yeah, she's asking the question: Do I base my decision on a fifty on a fifty percent discount? My th- my thought would be probably not. You've got to think it through a little bit longer. You want to, you'd want to be thinking about if I make that decision, say four thousand dollars, what's the repercussions of that? Because it's not a fifty percent discount rack off a, off your you know from Mize or something like that. You know, you're stuck with an asset that is. You know, sub, you know, it's going to be slow to move, yep. especially if you buy in a certain area where the days on market can extend out as far as six months, especially in a lot of regional areas. So you can be stuck with something that's not easy to move. I think uh, uh, earlier in the email she'd mentioned that she'd bought a block of land in Omeo, Victoria, which is um, near Mount Hotham. Oh, cool. Yep. Yeah, yep. so I've been up, up that way. I did a few ski seasons up there. But Omeo, yeah, I think they're trying to – you know how there's all that – uh, mountain biking and stuff that's going on in Derby here in Tassie. Mm. I think they're trying to create a kind of culture like that in the Victorian Highlands. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yep. she's kind of hedged her bets on that as well. So she sounds like she's clever and putting her money in some of the right places or at mm. least thinking about her investments as she's going. So it's, it's really interesting that she's re- reached out and... And he's looking into this. It's a yeah, it was a really interesting email to receive. And yeah, and with in her situation too, she's obviously got a bit of excess cash flow. So especially if you if the minute you've got minimum living expenses, you know you've got the capacity to be able to obviously put her money in different places, which is really exciting. And I mean, I, I think she did mention there that the um, yeah the what was it Omeo was a bit of a um, bit of a bet. But, yes, I think know, that, the, the exact words were looking to turn into Victoria's version of Tasmania's Derby. May yeah. or may not pay off. <laughs> Sort of, sort of betting on this one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you've got the capacity and you're young to be able to make those risks, well, then it's fine. You know, I think why not? But I think, yeah, back, back to back to the point is like the where I think about any little for, forms of um, uh, um, schemes, effectively. Yeah. You really want to think of it long term, not um, oh, I'm saving four grand now. It must be a good thing because it's not always, especially if it doesn't fit within your lifestyle. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you really got to consider: um, Are you buying this property for a long-term investment? Are you looking for it to move in based on your lifestyle and your goals? Um, versus, I'm just going to grab this because I get a discount. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. can go to Bali for a few weeks with the money I save on that. Yeah, exactly. Instead of looking into your property or yeah, exactly. Look, everyone's got their own money; they spend it the way they want. Yeah, yeah, and and, and that I mean that's just sort of my my, my thoughts on it. Yeah. And again, we'll be, I'll be the first to admit there's going to be no right or wrong answer to this, and someone's going to be screaming at me, going, "That's stupid advice." Well, yeah. well, but it's sort of what's that? Uh, 
the way I see it. Yep, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of lifestyle, the uh, this could segue into the next one. The other mm. another email we've got here is um, I think it's from recently the split couple, and they're kind of uh, she's a mother of two. She's trying to work out getting back on her feet, and I think essentially when you mm. break down the email, it's saying it's really tricky to manage the cost of living, rent the kids having the a decent lifestyle, but yeah, save for the future. So she goes into the story that what she's paying in rent could easily be paying for a mortgage in a great house, but yep. I can't get that deposit together to get my foot in the door. Yep. How do you go about getting yourself back on track? Like, is there a way? I think what she essentially asked in the end is, are there any incentives or government initiatives that can help get her out of the rental game and into the property, into the property game, into the owner? Circle. Yeah, exactly. And another thing she had too is that uh, she'd gone through a divorce, and her, her ex partner had, you know, obviously kept kept the property. So now with a with a lifestyle, obviously she's in a position where, of you know, in that case, she's got a lot of expenses going out now. So yeah, just crawling back's a little bit hard. And the the first thought that had come to mind was, and this was something that someone taught me, and this is completely unrelated to property, but in every instance in real estate over your course of your life, everyone's going to have a hindsight story. So it's really hard to look back at it and go, God, I wish I'd made those made a different decision in that time. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and the first thing I, that someone taught me is that, well, look, even if you had your time over again, um, you can't take the lessons back with you. So you'd be making the exact same decision again. I always, you know? I used to think of this back, I was like, if you could ever go back in time and change one thing in your life, like, what would you do? Like, oh, I'd go back and I'd, like, back to the future style and I'd change this, and but then it would have this ripple effect across the whole time and space continuum mm. but ultimately you'd probably still end up in the same space so that whole sliding yeah. doors yes yes um concept yep you're still the person you are so eventually you'd probably be led down the same path sorry yeah no it's good in yeah. my brain i was just picturing marty yeah. mcfly and i was like man i'd go and get <laughs> i'd go get myself a hoverboard i'd come back in time i'd invent it myself <laughs> and then we'd all have hoverboards yeah exactly well i mean but i, I, I sort of preface that because it's in this instance, I'm going to be really careful not to go down the thought of, oh, you sh- this is how you save, this is how you, you know, skip on money and save yep. a deposit. That's not really the question here. And there's much better resources on how to go that slow game. But what she's really asking is, okay, it's, I'm, I'm going to be paying 400 bucks a week, and I'd rather be paying 400 bucks on a mortgage. Oh, definitely. How do yep. I go about that? But I'd, really, it's going to be a long, long, long um, road out of Eden to be able to before I can have a sizable deposit to have you know 10 percent available, five percent available to then secure that loan. So there's a couple – one of the things she did ask is the idea of a guarantor but certainly didn't want to go asking people for it. Now, what a guarantor can do is just say you've got a family member or even some really close friends that are in an okay position. It's whoever might be able to assist you is that what, what the guarantor does on a loan is that they'll put up you know, a part of their capital in their property as the bank's security. So what that means is if you've got a if you've got a purchasing a home for I'll just use five hundred thousand yep. um, dollars that you need a fifty thousand dollar deposit which is you know ten percent you don't have any of that money what they could do then is that the bank will take that security deposit from let's I'll just use your, let's just say it's your, my place your, yep. your 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 place and you're helping me out and be like so then um, they actually have um, a covenant on your property as well. That says that okay, you, they have a fifty uh, fifty thousand dollar interest in your property in order for them to be able to provide the loan on mine. It's like when you go to the service station and you don't have enough money to pay for the fuel, so you leave your Rolex at the counter. Exactly. And say right. I'll come back and grab that later. Little do they know, fake Rolex you bought in Bali. But in this case, it's your mate's fake Rolex in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> so ain't no thing. So it often happens, and that happened with uh, my partner where her parents because she couldn't um, didn't have the capacity to save for a large deposit well then the um, her parents went up as guarantor on the loan and then she was able to secure that property and was then um, was able to pay it off uh, normally then after three years had passed she'd had enough equity in the home now the house was revalued and so the bank was able to take that covenant off the parents property um, yep. and then now she owns it outright without any interest from her parents so what happens the reverse of that like that's the silver lining side of the story what happens mm. on the other side of that if it all goes ass up with the so i'm mm. i've left my rolex and i want my rolex back what happens if they default on the new house where i'm guarantoring it mm. well the the challenge is you've got to start coming up with the money so then yeah so i'm putting mm. myself in the position the risk. yep so there is risk involved it Absolutely. is one of those really tricky Kind of, so I think in the email she's kind of said I wouldn't 
want to ask because I wouldn't want to put someone in that situation. That's right. So ultimately, it's got to come down to the relationship that you have with yeah. the parents, the person, yep. whoever is leaving the Rolex at the counter. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and I mean that, that's that's a reality of it. No, that that's a whole part of uh, making these big purchases and why the contracts are as complicated and convoluted as they are, is because there's a lot of risk involved. Yep. One thing that's um, you can have confidence then is if you are looking to buy a house in that don't buy something way above the average in the area so what i mean by that is you need to secure when you want to be looking at a property that's not high risk now a higher risk property in this small story that we're telling about might be if you've got an uh, average medium price in the area of four hundred thousand dollars if you buy a house below or at that, it's going to be really easy to turn that over regardless of what happens in the market at the time because there's always people moving in that bracket. Yeah, sure. But all this, So that list is at the three-bedroom house, standard, you know, there's people coming and going all the time, investors, first-time buyers, you name it. But then if you purchased a $700,000 house in that area... In that area, same street, kind of. Yeah, it's like you've got the best house in the, in the street. Well, yep. then the turn... And it's worth three four $400,000 more than anything else. The availability of people that want that particular per- that property is going to be much smaller. So yep. it's going to be much harder to turn over. So in the instance that if you are reaching out for someone to help you out, don't make it harder than it has to be. Yeah, yeah, I know? get what you mean. Like you know, it, It'd be like buying a really specific... Actually, Pat sent through... I'll add it to the show notes. Pat sent mm. through a property that I think was in St Kilda the other day. It was all decked out in steampunk, and it had a um. Oh, I saw that. The yeah. alien yeah. desk in the. It was like, so just to get the picture for the listeners out there, it mm. was the like the Ridley Scott film Alien and James Cameron Aliens, all like the xenomorph kind of style aliens. All the furniture was targeted at. That kind of fence. It was very, very specific. And yep. I think it said you could buy it without the furniture, but he was hoping to sell it yeah. as is. Yep. But So that's so specific that if you were to default on that or bugger out on that, yeah, you, it's a way riskier bet than having your standard... Just a, just a simple house that could move easily. Another one that was funny was in the States I saw, and this particular house was, uh, most of the properties in the area were like four or 500,000, but this one was two and a half million, two million, because legitimately it was an ex-pimp, porn producer, <laughs> who had be, you, you, had built this, uh, like, oh, it was a f- crazy house. Really. <laughs> <laughs> there was some really interesting designs about it. And as the agent was, ta- this, I think this was the third agent by the end, <laughs> to try and explain what this thing is. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 the, uh, the person doing the mini doco on this uh, property yep. was just cracking up because just nothing about this house made any sense until you heard who it was that built it. Yeah, but they just couldn't sell this place. So it had a specific purpose. Yeah, and it would yep. be hard to sell it to anyone that's not in the same industry. Exactly right. Yeah. So it was just a, a really hard to move property. You know. So. Yeah, I mean, with with that, and I've probably got that wording wrong because I'm thinking off the top of my head with a guarantor, so apologies if it, uh, it's not 100% correct. But you're right in asking is that if you are going to reach out to someone, there's no no harm in asking. Uh, but obviously you have to be mindful that you they are, you know, you're, they're making a commitment to help you out. Yep. Um, so you really want to be, you know, don't overextend yourself if someone's given you that grace of helping you out. 414 Real Estate has been operating within the northern suburbs of Hobart since 2006. With their innovative approach to marketing and managing your property, they have all your property needs covered. Find out more by visiting them today at 414.com.au. This might sound silly as well, but someone else mentioned it to me the other day and I kind of did that, you know, nod and just be like, oh yeah, I get you. And we were actually talking about the podcast. It was on a Buck's Day, we were talking about the podcast. I was like, oh, I've got to sound like an expert, oh, even yeah. though my role on the panel is to not be the expert. But you said just then as well, the bank will come in and revalue your house. Mm-hmm. So how does that work in that then they come in and revalue it? And why does the money go back? Why does the covenant, as you say, go back? Can, to it, the, can it be lifted? Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. So let's just... Um, this is good because I'm at the wedding this weekend. So if so they can, ask me again, yeah. I can be like, oh, hey, guys... <laughs> Cool. Got it. All right, I'll give you our, our house example. Yep. So uh, we wanted to do a reno- uh, a large renovation. It was, well, it's been mentioned a few times. Yep. Okay, so I think we – now the house at the time, there was 280000 on the loan with the, the value of the house being four hundred around about four hundred and twenty. So – but that said is that the bank, as it understood, the purchase price is only about three fifty or something. So in that instance, as the bank understands it from the original loan, 
You've got 280 owing. Yep. There's and we purchased it for 350. I can't, these numbers aren't exact, but roll, roll with me here. Yeah, I'm, I'm so, with you. Yeah, so the difference between 280 to 350 is seventy thousand dollars. So as far as the bank sees it, there's seventy thousand dollars of equity. Okay. Yes. Yep. However, obviously the market had changed since the purchase. So then we had the bank revalue it, and then it came up to 420. So now, if you think about it, the difference between 420 and 280 is 140 thousand dollars. So that is one that has just yep. boggled my mind forever and you've just put it to me yep. and I get it. So the thing is then is that when it comes to releasing a person of a guarantor is the reason why that's there is the bank needs a certain amount of equity in the property. The thing is to make sure that they, they're not if, if they had to fire sell the property, they're not going to be stuck. Um, so there's always that's why they use normally the, the 20% is if you've got 20% deposit on your property, they won't get out the mortgage lender's insurance which, remember, as we learned in a previous episode from... Uh, Who did we learn that from? Andrew from Rams. Oh, yeah, Leggett. Leggett. Um, Shout out to Leggett. Yep, so... Um, well, then, because remember, that that insurance policy is specifically to the, protect the bank in the event that you default. doesn't protect you whatsoever. Yes, yes. So, yes, yes. if then, using our house was an, as an example, you go to now, all of a sudden, there's obviously in excess of 20% deposit now. If there was a guarantor on the property, well, then there's more than enough to, to, cover, that. to cover that as a new you deposit. You get your Rolex back. You get your Rolex back, you know. Yes, you I learnt something. <laughs> yeah. ah, I've had a, that conversation with people about three times and I can never get it. Yeah, yeah. And well, I got it. Yeah, I got well, it today. It's just, and that, um, well, the, well it's, it, is, it is a confusing one sometimes, you know. Yeah. Um, and look, it, it can backfire. Like, but obviously in the Tasmanian market, we've had 50% growth over the last five years. A lot of people have actually got more equity in their home than they actually realise. Yeah. So what do you do with that equity? Well, you can go out and buy TVs, get renovations, go buy the properties, and that's a whole for another discussion. But, you know, in this instance, it's just about, you know, might be freeing up the person that helped you out to begin with. Hell yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. I feel good. I could, <laughs> I could finish right now because I'm happy that I've learnt, but it's not all about me. It's about the <laughs> listeners out there. I yeah, can't so- wait to go to this wedding. As a family-run business, First National Real Estate McGregor understands that the property market can be stressful. However, with a strong team in both sales and rentals, we are here to guide you through the property maze. Find out more today at McGregorFM.com. That sort of covered off a couple of things that the guys were asking. So the next one that um, my mate asked when we were at um, an engagement party, and this one gets asked a lot, is how do I know if I'm overcapitalising? Yes. So here's a good instance where you might have, if you're trying to build that equity into your house, you could be spending money on all the wrong things. Like alien-related tables. Exactly right. Or that's the right thing if you're into that. But Yeah. So this one, it, it, it's, not a, it's not an exact science, but we were helping a client out in a property in Austin's Ferry. He's living interstate at the moment. His mates are handy as well, so they could do a lot of the work themselves. So he's asking me the question he wants to sell, what am I going to do that's going to give me the bi- biggest amount of profit? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So where do I put my money so that I'm going to get the best return? Best return because I can't leave it as it is because it's obviously it's, it's not not in a good enough condition. We'd have to sell it or advertise it at a very attractive price. Yeah. So people, but the thing is, is that when the remember that conversation we had with if you listen back with um, Adam Luttrell, one of the things we talked about was sometimes not everyone wants to go through the process of renovating. Some people just want to buy the house done yep. and are prepared to pay a premium for it. So the question what the people are really asking is how do I put my property in a premium position without having to spend the money to get there? So the three ways that I look at it, you're protecting your value. Yep. You're enhancing your value. Yep. Yep. Or then you're you're overcapitalizing. So you're putting you're spending too much more than you're getting back. Yep. So what I mean by protecting capital or protecting your value is that's the stuff in the home where take for example in we're in a house in um, Yola Street in Rose Bay. We just sold that and there was a bunch of little moving, movement cracks that are just the building inspector was like, look, it's fine, it happens, it's, it's the clay soil, it expands, it contracts, you've got lath and plaster in the house, it's unavoidable. Did but you say laughing plaster? Uh, did I say lath? I don't know what that is, but it made me think of laugh, plaster that laughed and I'm like, well, of course it's going <laughs> to yeah. crack if it's laughing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good old laughing plaster. It's gonna, <laughs> gonna <laughs> oh, yes. um, so with that though, um, by um, with those cracks uh, evident, yep. you know, in this case it was okay. In fixing those cracks, for example, if you let's just imagine there's a house that's it's riddled with it, it might cost you a thousand. Let's just use a thousand bucks. Yep. Um, someone's gonna someone might look at that. Well, I've spent a thousand bucks. Now it's worth a thousand dollars more. Well, no. 
you're protecting it because now you're eliminating those uh, this those issues. A, that's right. And one one way I looked at it, this was a great one from a previous property manager. Shout out to Damien. Um, he called it the butt syndrome. And what do you mean by the butt syndrome? Is someone walks through a house and they're like, oh, oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. Oh, I love that. And then all of a sudden they put their green accounting hat visor on and, they, and they're like, Ooh, but that, but that, but that. And every time you hear a but, it's ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. So in the protecting your value, that, that's eliminating the but syndrome. You know, um, all the stuff that's maintenance orientated. Taking um, the butts out of property. Taking the butts out of property. So all those little bits, and sometimes you have to work a long way back. We had one in um, Brushy Creek and Lennon Valley where the foundations had to be resettled and it cost the owner 30 grand. They're not going to get that 30 grand back in terms of the sale. But mind you, it, it, if they were to sell it in that condition, well, the, the perceived cost of it probably would have been closer to 50. Yeah, 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 for or 50, sure. Uh, closer to 50. So um, they had to go through, that mo- go through those motions. And again, it's that long game stuff we were talking about before. You can be thinking, oh, well, if I'm spending this 30, I'm going to get that back. Sometimes not. Yeah, yeah, and that's where you know p- purchasing a property is. But you know, if you're if you're a person who can purchase those problems and do it yourself, there's every likelihood that you can make those returns. But we're just using the case where you're having to get professionals in every single time. Yeah, but yeah. Just it's just those thoughts that all those protecting your value main elements aren't going to enhance it. It's just protecting it. So that was your second place. one was enhancing? So the next one's enhancing the value. So now this is where you're going into bringing the property to a point where you're selling to someone who doesn't want to do those works themselves. There's, there's, there's a heap of them, but a really easy example that's a, you know, a quick fix is paint and carpet. Yep. You know, Faux show. Sure. Um, and sometimes even that's removing the carpet and polishing the beautiful boards underneath. And that's really – that's quite common in Tassie because we've got a lot of properties, even in um, ex, you know, ones that are built by um, housing – you know, had beautiful hardwood floors. Oh, yeah. So That's what we, I found in my place. Exactly right. I just had my floors uh, done by, shout out to Cruise Flooring. Simon was a <coughs> legendary bloke. He's, uh, but yeah, no, my floors, I remember moving in and the carpet was in there and I just pulled up one of the corners of the carpet in the lounge room. Honey, get in here. Like, <laughs> What's happened? What's happened? These floors are bloody polished. <laughs> <laughs> but then we did a bit of renovating. We had to redo it all. But yeah, yeah, yeah. ultimately, I was like, I didn't know these like bad boys were under here. Like, this is best news ever. So you can absolutely be expecting you're going to get a return on that if you're sold. Yep. You're really enhancing the value of that house, and it's not like it's a huge job. You know, that was that's something that you know you've ripped it up. Wow. Yeah. So that's gonna that they're, they're your, like your biggest returns for your smallest investment a lot of the time because I know that's not you know um, hard work, but it's ve- really visually impacting. Now, if you had just the uh, um, in your instance, though, you, you obviously you saw the potential in the house anyway. But uh, we had one that was just a small house uh, in uh, New Norfolk at Doant Terrace, and that, that the carpet had been there forever, and it was just shocking. But you ripped it up, and there was the, the the boards underneath were just absolutely stunning. So we just took the whole carpet out of the house. Yep, we d- and we didn't even polish up the boards. So was, within yeah, that, twenty that, minutes of ripping it all out, yeah, that was done. You've you know? added or you've enhanced. The value of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> so obviously every house is subjective, but I mean, some really simple principles, but go, talking about ripping up carpets. So the, the story that Adam and I were referred to was the property at um, McGuinness Crescent, Lena Valley. And in, in that instance, we started at the perceived value of, you know, sort of the thinking you'd have interest around about 400, 420. Um, and that's when I had a discussion with the family because they were, this was their oldest family home. They'd grew up in it. So there's a lot of love in it, yep. but they needed to maximise the profit for their parents because all that money was going into the retirement home. Yep. So they really needed to get as much money out of this property as possible. The plan that we built was there was a couple of rooms that had some old gnarly cupboards and stuff. So we took those out, removed excess stuff that didn't make sense. And then we, yeah, we ripped up the old carpet, we polished the boards and we painted the house. Um, and that's where, in that story, we, we've changed our perception from, say, 400 to 420. We're now at sort of 450, 460, yep. uh, or 450, 470, more appropriately. And then that's when we went down the path of approaching Adam and saying, look, let's get this house styled because of the, the upfront expense. They weren't confident in it. But I said, look, you know, you've got to trust me on this one. And that's when, after it was done, you know, they went, oh, yeah, I see what you mean. And you got a return near 500 or something. It was like, yeah, 495, 500. And I remember it was it was a cold winter's day and there was nearly 60, 70 pairs of shoes. There was three of us at the open home just because people would just, you know, stream through it. Yeah, wow. And if you hark back, and I know that, that exact family, they'd moved from Victoria. They wanted a house that was done 
they wouldn't have bought the house in its at its beginning state. Yeah. So it opened up to a whole new market of buyers that were prepared to pay the premium in order to secure the house because they wanted to move into it. Yep. Yeah. So that was a really good example of enhancing the value. Now, moving into overcapitalization, that's a dangerous space of wet areas are a really dangerous one to be to be doing that in, yep. um, like kitchens, bathrooms, because the the blowout budget on those can be enormous and not many people even if you um you know classic thing is you can buy five uh, five hundred dollar tap or a two thousand dollar tap you know um you, that's you're not going to get that money back yeah yeah you know? there, there are instances where it is going to make a difference and, and it always will because you obviously make the house more saleable but it's you've got to be it's a really careful balance between if you aren't doing the work yourself um you know and you're choosing really high-end finishing products you're not always necessarily going to mean that that's going to mean dollar for dollar return yep um actually the other one is too people ask i think probably the biggest over cap- capitalization is what if i put an extension am i going to get that back well in Hobart at the moment, any you know, a, a builder is going to be budgeting in from anywhere from two and two and a half thousand dollars per square meter at the moment. So, yep. are you going to be able to see that back at the end of your sale? Don't know. Um, and but would it matter? Would it depend on what you're putting in? Kind of thing? like if you put an extra bedroom in, it might add an extra value. But if you just put in uh, laundry, yeah, yeah, laundry, it might not. Laundry is not going yeah, like, yeah, to add too much value. You might build a giant laundry for two grand a square meter, and it's not just look. It's a it's a it's a big laundry. Why did you build a laundry this big? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can put a bed in there as well. So now it's a laundry bedroom. <laughs> yeah. So I think that there, it is a it's a hard conversation when someone asks, "Well, how do I avoid overcapitalizing?" Because every house itself is very very specific, and again, it comes to the area. So remember, in the early in the episode, I, I the, se- the, the seven hundred thousand dollar house in the four hundred thousand dollars. That's street. right. Yep. So so if you've got a property that's already well far and exceeding the average in the area, well, then it's a much dicier sort of game to play. In. And if if you're if you're expecting that your your average in the area is four hundred thousand dollars and now because you've done thirty thousand dollars of work you want a five hundred thousand dollar home well there might not be a strong market for that either so you really want to be assessing this depending upon where your property sits in the market how that compares to others in the area and then have an expectation of what you want out of that renovation as well so you know taking the things you know, ticking off the list okay my first goal list is to protect my value the second one is what are the tasks that's going to enhance it and then before i step over into the line of overcapitalizing. so in, in that, we'll go back to this, the, the one we just helped with uh, our client in Austin's Ferry. We've actually said in this case that he has to upgrade the kitchen um, because okay, it's, yep. it's a nightmare. Like, it's just shocking. And to put in, you know, one of those prefab prefab ones from Bunnings like or whatever Like a caboodle or something from yeah, Bunnings. Yeah, caboodle. Yep. Um, you know, that's not uh, – and he can do the work. It's going to make a big difference because the kitchen was so bad that no matter what he does to the rest of the house – You're it, still going to have it, that bad taste in your mouth. Yep. If, so fresh car – Fresh carpet is not going to make a difference because they're going to walk into that kitchen and go, oh, my God. Yep. So he has to go down that path. Doing the kitchen is actually going to um, is both protect and enhance in his particular case. Yeah, for sure. But that advice isn't always true. We had one that we just sold in Montrose Road where we'd actually gone through and got all the quotes to be able to say, and which amassed to about 12 grand, which was carpets, new blinds and vinyl and painting. And then at the end of it, I looked at it. I looked at the comparable sales in the area versus what he needed, and I went, "Let's just not do it. Yeah. Let's, let's go to market. Let's let him choose around carpets. Let him choose around paint." Um, and we ended up getting a premium price for that unit in the area in its sta- in current its current state, state without yep. enhancing with, without having to drop twelve grand. Yep. Um, so um, in that instance, even though you know you'd say yes, go go ahead and I'll do it, but if we went all all that way down that path, I couldn't foresee that he'd actually get the net return from it. Yeah, yeah, for um, sure. So again, you know. It's mindful about where you use what you need. Yeah, yeah cool. That was sweet. Actually, really like we could do a whole episode on that. I enjoyed that part of the conversation. I've enjoyed the whole conversation, John. Yeah, hopefully it's all right. I was actually really <laughs> worried coming in. Not that I know that me and you can't talk for hours on end, but I was like, could we stay on topic for half an hour yeah. without Pat here? Yeah, me too. Yeah. And we're all, we've done very well. Well, the thing, I mean – this, this Max mailbag, I reckon it'd be a lot of fun, but, you know, sometimes I still second-guess myself to know whether or not I know what I'm talking about. But, again, it's enhancing mm. your knowledge. To Sometimes just verbalising things is a way of kind of double-checking with yourself, like, oh, oh yeah, I didn't realise I knew that. Yeah, yeah. And you've just kind of verbalised it all through. It's the same with that conversation I said I had three times, four times, I'm just not along and, oh, yeah, I know <laughs> what you're talking about. Well, the, cha- the challenge is too, I mean, the devil's always in the details. So when if someone's asking, you know, there's usually general principles that help um, and then you just find out, you know, what. All right, but then what's your specific need? Yep. And then we, you know, tackle that specific need. For sure. Yeah. Well, well it's been fun. That was good. That was awesome. Um, we missed you, Pat, though. Shout That's out true. to your boy. 
Uh, we'll see you next week. Pat's out the uh, – he's helping out with the BMX this week, so it's not his sick or he's, he's – He's actually – yeah, he's – well, he's, he's – Volunteering. He's well, yeah. like he's selling houses and he's doing this BMX. He's going crazy. It's his little baby. He's very proud of it. And yeah. So yeah. if you're listening to this the week that it comes out and you're interested, there's a big event, the Clash for Cash, down near Mona Museum. Um, it's I think there's a ten thousand dollar prize pool, which Pat's gone into all this effort and all the other people volunteering at the Southern City BMX, but mm. just supporting local community. Pat is out there. Um, and shout out to the Clash for Cash. So get down there on Sunday. I, found, I sound like a real radio jockey down there. <laughs> yeah. Get down there on down Sunday. Down there for cash. This is the Clash for Cash. <laughs> yeah. No, shout out to Pat. We do miss you anyway. in the studio. It's been a good little morning. And uh, cheers for the yarn, Johnny. Cool. All right, buddy. Catch you later. All right. See you. You have been listening to The Property Pod, produced and edited by 414 Media House in conjunction with 414 Real Estate and McGregor First National Propriety Limited. This podcast is general information only and the thoughts and views expressed is the opinion of our panel and listeners should always seek and use their own investigation into any topic we discuss to ensure they fully understand their own situation. It does not constitute and should not be relied on as purchasing, selling, financial or investment advice or recommendations expressed or implied and it should not be used as an invitation to take up any agent or investment services. No investment decision or activity should be undertaken on the basis of this 